Well, we can get started. So um, Colin has what we're going to go over today then, and, and you probably saw the note that I had sent out earlier that we'll just cover what Colin has left and then we'll pick up the rest of it next week. So sound good? I think we have plenty. All right, Colin, it's all <laughs> I think we still have plenty to go through. I was looking through this and I was like, okay, we still have some left to go. So um, I guess we can do our, well, I got to share my screen. I got to get better at that habit. I keep, keep forgetting to share my screen with everybody. That's desktop two. Okay. Can everybody see my slides? Okay, good. Um, okay. So welcome to week 21. Uh, we're going strong here. So week 21, we're going to talk about functions. Uh, we're going to have some fun with functions today. Uh, to kind of get started off, I guess we can do our quick five minute icebreaker. Um, heard any good tips lately? Uh, you don't have to, they don't have to be R specific or data analysis specific, just in general. Have you heard any good tips? General life tips, cooking tips, mm, any tips at all? trying to think of any i i check um i check our stats on twitter pretty much every day just just to see what's going on and there's always stuff on on there so i don't know if you guys are twitter users you can you can subscribe to our stats it's hashtag our stats or i don't i don't know what that, that's not the tag obviously but but that's not the handle that's the tag that they put on there but there's always I Crazy can give Ryan, you know, I can give Ryan a very good tip is now you have a 14 years old daughter. You have at the bank, you have to have five bill notes. Never have just 20 because every time you give a 20, you will have never your money back. You have to have very, very small five, have a lot of five. So anytime you can just give five, not 20. <laughs> so that is a good tip. Huh? That's a good, that is a good tip. <laughs> uh, Maria, any tips for the group? Um, so I was, uh, one tip that I didn't know existed were the, um, shortcuts for R Studio. Mm -hmm. So, or for R scripts. Um, so one tip that I recently learned is that you can do, um, well, command in Mac or control in PC, shift at the same time and R, and that's going to create like, um, like a label for a section is going to create a, a label for a section of the of the script and then later on it's going to be easier to navigate so that was a cool tip that i recently learned yeah excellent uh there's a lot of like there's a lot of different um hot keys that are just awesome the one that i use like if i have really long code chunks uh control shift a, I think is what it is. So if you have something that's like, like a big chunk and it's getting like all kind of unorganized, if you highlight all that code and go control shift A, it will organize it a lot better and it will make it look better. It, it's, it's great. Like, especially when you're like doing ggplot2 code or something, it just makes it look a lot more better formatted. So, but I guess that's my can tip. You, go ahead. Can you do an example? Yeah, I was gonna see if you could do an example, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's it's not one that you can just pull uh, up. Like, how does it organize it? Yeah, so let me just see if I can do it here real quick. So, like, um, I just do it so often. So, like this code right here, like what you can do, you can see this, right? You can see yep. my R Studio. Okay, cool. Um, if you go highlight it, go Control Shift A. Now oh, it might already be organized, but here, let me just do like. Let's see if I kind of manipulate it a little bit. Uh, so like if you had something like this, I don't know if this is going to work, but if you highlight it and then you go control shift A, it will organize it for you and it will oh, look nice. a little bit better. Yeah. So if you have like a really big code chunk and then you go control shift A, it will like reorganize it. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it just kind of helps out. So that's my tip for the day. That's my tip for the day. <laughs> um, but yeah, hotkeys are great. There's another way to access all the hotkeys too in our studio. I can't remember what it is, but there's like a, is it Apple key? No, there's some hot, you can press to get all the hotkeys to pop up and stuff, but tips, pro tips. 
they're all great to have. Any tips you have, please, please pass them along. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, I think everybody's pretty familiar with these. I don't need to go in these in depth. I think the biggest one is probably this one. If we need to slow down, just let me know. Some sections I might breeze through because I really want to try and get chapter 19 done. So we can, or yes, we get chapter 19 done to move through the rest of this. Uh, but if we do need to slow down, just let me know. And, in, and I've also had the observation that when we do slow down and like kind of discuss things and work through it, I think that's probably where this group has done the most learning, at least for me, because I can see what other people are thinking and we can try stuff out. So don't be afraid to slow me down. Um, tonight's discussion, we'll talk about conditional execution where we left off last time. We'll discuss some function arguments and then we'll talk about return values and then we'll talk about environments very briefly. Uh, what we'll kind of, we'll, we'll start with conditional execution. I sent off some, like an example sheet with a bunch of examples that I put together because I felt that having some examples will highlight the points better than just trying to kind of talk about what the book has. So I attached that notebook into, um, on a thread onto our Zoom scheduling thing that popped up. So if you want to download that and have that on your computer, you're more than welcome to have it. I'll share it again once we get done talking about that stuff tonight. So let's pick up with conditional execution. Uh, just as a quick reminder, um, we got to remember the standard return rule. And the standard return rule is basically a function will always return the last value that is computed. And so anytime that a function is run, it's going to return that last value that was returned in the function. Now, there were ways to modify that. We talked about that last time, like explicitly using return. And we also talked about the double, the double assignment arrow. But in general, if you just remember the standard return rule that a function returns the last value that is computed, you're in a pretty good spot. So the best way that I think of conditional statements, conditional statements modify function behavior and what gets returned. And so if you have, if you have like, if you want your function to be a little bit more flexible or to return things based on certain conditions or inputs that your user provides to you, that's where these conditional statements come in. And so the book kind of opens up with this, with the, concept of the if else statement. So if condition is true, run this code. If it is false, run this code within this bracket here. And so this is just kind of the general structure. In this, you'll have a condition, which we'll talk about here in a second, but then you'll have your code in here. And if your condition evaluates to true or false, that depends on what gets actually run. And so the best way to think about this, I mean, many of you probably have used Excel before. When I started learning the if else kind of conditional statement, I just always kind of remember Excel because Excel had that easy if else statement and you just did if this, else this, and it was just kind of easy to remember. But in our case, anything that goes in between these brackets or these curly braces could be anything. You know, it could be anything that you want it to be. It could be thousands of line of code, but it could be anything that you want to execute, compute, or return as a side effect, which we'll talk about here in a second. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I want my functions to be a little bit more flexible. Well, what's nice about this is that we can extend our if else statement into a chained uh, if else statement. So more complex behaviors can be kind of uh, modified using these if else conditions. And I actually have this incorrect because there should be an actual condition with this else if. But basically what we have here is, is we have our condition that gets tested from our inputs from our function. If true, it gets executed. If that's not true, it will move to the next step, do the condition. If that's true, it's run. If not, it will run that last else statement. And again, I kind of screwed this up because there should be a condition in here, but um, this is how you can chain this over and over again. And I'll share kind of an example when I share like kind of my example function that I created. But this is a way to modify your behavior based on the inputs that you provide into your function or your user provides into your function. So when we're writing conditions, oh, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, just a quick question. So <clears throat> I assume it works like most other 
um, like conditionals where as soon as it reaches the first true, it does that and then it's then it's done, right? It then it exits. That's what I yeah, that's what I assume. I, I, I think of it as kind of a linear, it runs linear, right? So here's your yeah. first condition. So it will test it. If it is true, it will run it, return whatever value is, and the rest of this won't run. So it's kind of like yeah. it's kind of like a step ladder, like check here, next, yeah. check, next, and then anything else that is not evaluated gets caught by that kind of else statement. Yeah. And and if it if you happen to have two if else statements and the condition was met in both of them, it would still just run the first one because that's the first one it would hit. So like if you're if it the first can if if the very first thing is like if um, x is uh, you know less than five, but your number is twenty five, it's not going to run that, and it'll go to the next one. And then if that's if else x is greater than ten, then it's going to run that. But then if the next if else is if x is greater than fifteen, it's never going to get to that one even though it's true. Like yeah, be, yeah, basically, you, yeah, because you got to remember that basically it's going to run whatever code you have in here, and that's like the computation that it's going to run and return that last value, and then the function's done. Yeah, it's done. Yeah. Okay. So you could do what you're going to do. We're going to talk about multiple conditions here in a little bit, but what I think, like, what you're kind of thinking of, if you want to have like multiple tests for a condition, you can do that. Um, but this is more of like one check, next step check next step check, you know, and kind of like do like a catch all of like, if the function didn't evaluate to true kind of thing. Yeah. That's a good question. Okay. Though. Cool. Um, so we can kind of chain those things together, which is kind of nice because you could inevitably have, a, you know, an infinite number of this FL statements if you had to. Um, obviously you want to keep it simple and keep, thing, keep your functions kind of simple, but if you wanted to extend it to a longer else if statement, you have the opportunity to do that. So um, some things to think about when we talk about conditions, again, those conditions are what get evaluated through like these kind of steps within the conditional execution. And there's a couple of things that you want to keep in mind with conditions, they need to evaluate to a Boolean, which is either true or false. Okay. And it can only, and it's best, I'm trying to think of the phrasing. It's best to well, functions only are really great if you have a conditional that evaluates to one Boolean. So if you have a vectors of Booleans, you're going to get a warning symbol or you're going to get a warning return. And then it's only going to use your first Boolean in that vector. And if, you, if an NA gets passed into that conditional, you're going to get an error and nothing's going to run. And so I always, I always used to remember the NAs as an error, but the vectors one was the one that always used to throw me because I would always try and do like multiple conditions by passing in a vector, thinking that that would work. And then I would get this warning message, which I'll show an example here in a second, but, um, and I could share it right now, but you get like this warning of warning um, in if true, false, the condition has length greater than one. And so the first element gets returned. Um, it's going to use that first element. So if you have a true false vector and it gets passed in that conditional, it's only going to go for true, run whatever's in your true condition or in your true section of your conditional execution, and then um, return whatever's in there. So I just kind of put this kind of like step-by-step -step tree together, talking about condition. If it, eva if it evaluates to a valid condition of a one single Boolean, true or false, your code will run. If it's an invalid condition, such as a vector, you're going to get a warning message. And then if you get, if you pass along a NA value, you're going to get an error and it's not going to run. So it's just kind of, kind of nice to keep those things organized to kind of think about what you're passing into your conditionals. If you do have conditional execution within your function, but again, the kind of rule of thumb is one single Boolean in your condition. So when we talk about, oh, I think I was going to share some of these. So I have some examples that I've created of just some simple functions kind of using these if else statements. I'm going to kind of use this function throughout our conversation today. But I just created a simple function called print hello. Um, and I'm going to kind of extend this function a little bit throughout this. But basically, we have this kind of simple function here. All it's going to do is print hello. And so if I run it, 
I get hello returned back. But um, there's people in our group that speak multiple languages. So I'd like to say hello to somebody who speaks a different language. And so let's just say I would like to extend it a little bit to be able to say hello in French. And I will tell you that I unfortunately cannot speak another language. So some of these are Google translated. So if I accidentally hack something, please let me know. I'm sorry. I should know more languages, but I don't. So I had to rely on Google. So um, just let me know. But anyways, here's kind of an example of our kind of a simple conditional execution with if else. I'm going to pass this argument called English equals true. I do have a default argument in here. So if I don't, if I run this function without anything, it will just take this argument in English equals true, and then it will return that English. So if I define the function this way, and I run my print hello the first time, I'm just going to get hello in English. And if I want it in French, because I have this conditional defined in my function, I'm going to get the French bonjour. Sandra, am I correct in this? Is that the correct way to say? I'm sorry if my pronunciation is wrong, but again, I went with Google. So anyways, here's my print hello function. But what's nice about this is that we can extend our function using like an else if chain. And so um, Maria, Ecuador, right? I did a Google search. It's Spanish, correct? Okay, good. I want to make sure, um, just want to make sure I'm getting that correct. So let's just say I want to extend this to say hello in Spanish. Well, I can do that, but I'm going to have to use an if else statement and I'm going to have to change my arguments here. Here, I'm just going to pass in an NA as a default. And I have this kind of longer chain here where my conditionals are just checking if I've given my function a language that I want to be printed. So the languages that I'm looking for are Spanish. The one I'm looking for is French and then English. And if I don't provide an, an, an answer or if I don't provide it, I'm going to get this kind of error that says no language selected. Please select these three. Um, the book doesn't really talk about the stop command, but all stop does is it just throws an error and stops execution. So, so let's just run this. If I run this, my print, have my print hello, I'm going to get the error, no language selected. You can select English, French, or Spanish. Okay. Well, here's hello. So hola, am I correct? Kind of remembering my um, 10th grade Spanish class. So I did have some Spanish, but I should practice more. If I want to do English, hello. And if I want to do French, bonjour. Okay. So now we're speaking in different languages with the functions that we have, using functions, and then also using a chained if else statement. Okay. So those are some basic examples for that. So uh, does anybody have any questions about that? Those are pretty basic, just kind of going through like if else statements. The biggest thing is, is just understand that if else statements and then else if statements chained together can just modify the function behavior. It, it makes sense to me. I'm curious about the, the, Greppel, uh, the Greppel function though. I haven't seen that before. Yeah, so it's like it's like string detect, so str detect, and oh. basically what it's doing is it's just looking for a string argument. So like, if English is held within the input string that I have, it's going to return either true or false. Gotcha. So it's basically all it is. It's just I think it's a base R verb, and or it's just yeah, it's a base R verb. Oh, it's it's just, just, it's even Unix, you know, you could do that in batch. It's very very old this one. Yeah. Um, and, and this is beyond this conversation, but, you know, sometimes when you're creating functions and especially if you're creating a function for a package, you might want to consider using base verbs. You can use dplyr verbs and tidyverse verbs and, and functions, but sometimes it's, it's good practice to use kind of those base ones because those are already brought in, but that's, that's a conversation beyond what we're doing here. But the short answer is that it just returns a true or false if it finds this string in what we're passing so gotcha cool um any other questions about that so now we're speaking in multiple languages so now my function can say hello in spanish french and english um okay so where am i at here so the book also talks about this idea of cold style when you're creating your functions i'm just going to briefly roll over these rules real quick um, the first one is be mindful of your curly braces 
So some of the rules that the book talked about is that your first curly brace should, should never go on its own line, but it should always be followed by a new line. So for example, when you look at this, here's my first curly brace. It's not on its own line. However, the book suggests if it's an ending curly brace, it should be on its own line. Case in point, this is my last brace for the function. It's, excuse me, it's on its own line, okay? That's just common practice. It's just a rule that the book kind of talks about. Uh, code in the body should be indented. So all of the code, and you'll see in my kind of example function, all of this code here within the body is indented. Um, and then drop curly braces only if, if, okay, so you can drop your curly braces for short if statements. So if you're just doing a quick if else check, you can drop the curly braces, but that's only if things are on like one line and you should try to avoid it. Now, the, um, the reason why we kind of do this, that the way that I kind of read it from the book was it just makes it easier to read and keep those three sections different. So if we move this over and look at this, it's hard to tell, well, what's the name of the function? What's technically the body? And what are the arguments within it? And so just doing some of these simple, these simple kind of, um, whoops, now I'm really kind of messing it up. If we just kind of do these simple things. Try control shift A, I heard that that's. <laughs> that's that's the new that's the new that's the new way to do it so control shift a yeah i kind of moved in there so um so that's a good one so if you don't have any indents do a control shift a and it will move it over for you so um but again it's just it just makes it easier for people to read it when they're kind of reading your functions um so when we talk about so the next thing that we're going to talk about is creating function arguments and so function arguments are just basically what we, what, what's contained in here. Now, there are a lot of different advanced ways to do this, um, especially if you read some of the advanced R chapter stuff. There's multiple ways of how to kind of handle this, um, but we're just going to kind of talk about some of the basic things. So when we think about the general arguments within this, there's usually two sets. There's the data argument which is the data that we want to do our computations on. So is it a tibble? Is it a data frame? Is it a vector? And then the ones that follow after that are our detail arguments. So what are the things that we're going to use to control the computation inside of the function? So um, this is just kind of another general practice that the book talks about. You usually want to start with your data arguments and then move on into your detail arguments the ones that kind of talk about are the detail arguments being the ones that modify that computation. So, and it just also kind of follows like what a function is, right? It takes a input. Well, I make it in trouble with the statement, but in a general sense, it takes an input, makes a computation and then has an output. And so you usually want to start with your input first rather than talking about, well, details first and then your input because for some of these details, you might not have a user change that input. You might already, they may just use all the defaults. So it's just always good to start with what's your input. Uh, so it also talks about default values. And so I, when we talk about this in this function here, my print hello with the chained else if statement conditional within it, I have a default statement, which is, or a default argument, which is NA. If we go back up to here, Here's my default, it's for English is true. You don't, uh, well, I shouldn't say that because I'm not 100% sure and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't necessarily need to have a default statement or a default, uh, default um, argument within it or a default value for your argument. So that's just, um, that's something to take into consideration. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. You don't have to have a default in there, but um, that just enforces that everybody or that people's using the function have to include a value. And if they don't, then it gives some kind of an error. So, yeah, it's like the uh, like if you had if English wasn't included in this and it was ran, it's like English or if English was included in this and it didn't have a value, it would be like error default value not defined. And yeah. so that's why I was a little hesitant when I said, does it need to have a default value? 
mainly because I was like, oh, well, what about that error? So, but yeah. yeah. Mm. Let's see. And then it also talks about um, default values and setting them. And usually you want to use the most common ones that you think your users are going to use, except in cases where safety is important. And so many of you have probably come across the NA.RM, which stands for removing NA values. And, you know, generally in data analysis, we want to be aware of our NA values. So if we have a function that sets NA remove as true and gives our users no warning that those NAs are removed, then that's, that's just that's just not good because we're not informed that one, that our data had NA values and two, that they were removed. So it's always good practice in certain cases that in safety or for safe or cases where we need to be safe with our computations, it's good to make sure that we have a default value that works with that one. Uh, the other one, use spaces. Um, don't be afraid to use those spaces. Uh, this is example from the book. This is just not good. There's no spaces in this in this um, in this function here, or the use of this function. So it's good just to kind of have clear spaces within it. Just make it readable, make it human readable. Okay, uh, so the book also talks some more about um, some function arguments as well. So like um, one thing that it talks about is with this is some of the common names that things are given. So looking at this. When we go into the book, and I've linked this in here, there are some like common names that are just kind of like common practice that people use. And I'll be honest, um, I only knew of a couple of these, like DF or data frame, but some of these other ones I have never seen. I mean, I've seen, but I never knew that these were like common practice for what we should what should be applied. Has anybody ran across some of these in like some of your work before? Did anybody know of these? <laughs> I I knew about uh, DF, IJ, XYZ, but uh, P for for me was for plot. Was usually, you know, to name the plots, but uh, like in an example or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will say that DF, EG, NP, it's a calculus. You know, it's when you say a matrix. So when you think base air, it completely makes sense now when you see it. Uh, for vector, I have seen usually V, not X, Y, Z. But the NNP, it just, mat in base air, it makes completely sense, but it's because it's matrix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've seen DF before, and then in statistics, N is usually used for the number of in your sample and stuff like that. Um, but like IJ, it took me a little bit to remember XYZ. So I guess kind of the thing is, is that just know that these are some of like the common ones. So if you come across a function in the wild and you see these used as argument names, this is why it's because they're just kind of common practice. But um, so uh, strive for descriptive names for your arguments. So, um, you know, we talked about this last time that anytime that you're trying to define a function uh, with the arguments within it, aim for descriptive names. Uh, again, it's going to be better for others and yourself. So if you create a function six months later, you come back to it and you're looking at your function and you're saying, I don't remember what LANG stands for, you know, maybe be a little bit more descriptive in that, in that case. And then use argument names from other functions. So if you if your function is going to have the option to remove NA values, use something that's already available, that's already been used. So, you know, no need to reinvent the wheel. Just stick with it. Uh, so the other thing that we want to talk about is like checking values, dot, 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 and a little bit about lazy evaluation. So we're going to go back to my example here with um, my print hello function. So... Well, one thing that we didn't talk about yet was um, can or chain conditionals with multiple conditions within them. Now, it took me a little bit to really understand what was going on when we had multiple conditions. Um, I found this Stack Overflow post and I linked it within the notes and it kind of did a pretty good job of explaining to me like what these functions actually do and that they're not vectorized. And it was good to kind of understand, okay, these are meant to only return one value. 
And so that was like a good check for us if, if we have multiple conditions. So I kind of played around with it a little bit in these examples to kind of see what they did to see what values get returned. If we use the double ampersand, you know, true, true returns true. In this case, it's going to return false because it returns the first false. But what's nice about it is that these are not vectorized. So if I just run a single ampersand here, it's going to return a vector of false, false, true. And if we run into our function, does anybody remember what's going to happen if we pass a vector into our function, into a conditional within a function? You're going to get a what? Gives an error, right? Not an error. Oh, a warning. It's going to give a warning. It's going to run it, and it's going to run the first value that it sees within the vector, which is false. So uh, just as something to keep, be aware of when you kind of do that. So, but if we do it this way, it's only going to return one value. So again, these this double ampersand is going to do the same thing. Um, so I just kind of played around with it. True, true. If we have a true false, because it has one true, it's going to return true. And again, just prove to you that these are not that these are vector are not vectorized. Here's just the single bar, and here's the double bar to show you that it returns a single value. So the book calls this short circuiting, and in our case, I'm going to use short circuiting to ask how was your day in my function. So I'm extending our function to go from uh, saying just hello to, to having the potential to say, hello, how was your day? And in our case, I'm going to use um, ask day where I have a default value of false. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of play around with it to see if I can use if el else if statements to use this argument to ask the day. Um, same kind of function, just adding these double condition or these uh, multiple condition checks in it to say, okay, Am I asking for day, true or false? And then does it contain the language Spanish? Does it contain the language English, French, so on and so forth? So let's practice this. Let's look at it. Here in my case, I run print hello. It's not gonna work. It's gonna say, hey, uh, you need to use English, French or Spanish. But in my case, I do wanna say Spanish and I wanna say true. Again, Maria, correct me if I'm wrong. But if I wanna say, how was your day? Now my function says, how's my day? Am I right? Was I close? Was Google good? Okay, good. Um, but if I don't want to ask how your day was and I just want to say hello, I could just say hola. Okay. Same thing with English because I'm asking your day. Hello. How was your day? If I just want to say hello. And then French the same way. French. I see Sandra stepped away. So hopefully my French isn't too bad. <laughs> but anyways, I think you get the point. So there, my function now, because I've added in these multiple conditions, I've made my function more flexible by being able to say, hello, just hello, or hello, how was your day? Okay. And the only way, the way that I see that we can achieve that is through um, using multiple conditionals. There might be another way to do it. Um, so if somebody's watching this video and knows a better, more simpler way to do this, please let me know. Okay, so let's go back to our slide. So does anybody have any questions about where we're at now with some of the stuff that we've talked about? I'm really hoping that my French wasn't too bad that Sandra had to run away. <laughs> uh, I'll have her check that later to make sure. Again, it's all Google. So um, anyways, so let's talk about return values. Um, these are the things that get returned. Um, so the th thing that the book wants us to take into consideration when we talked about return values is does returning early make your function easier to read? And so the good thing that I was thinking about this, and I always remember this when I first started learning functions, I read it somewhere, it's this idea of catching errors early and often. So if you see an error that's available, um, it's just good to always kind of do a check right away at the start. And so a good example of this is going back to our function, say someone provides to us a language that isn't available. Well, it's not necessarily not a value, but they did provide a language to us. And so what I'm doing is I'm creating this conditional right at the start to say, hey, you did provide us a language in the function. However, this function doesn't do that. 
And so I'm catching this error early rather than running all of this computation, then catching the error. So it's good to kind of think about catch errors early and often before you do the computation. Now with a simple function like this, it doesn't mean a lot, but if you're creating a function that takes an extensive amount of computation where it's your computer's gonna run for a while, one thing I'm thinking of is like web scraping or something like that. It would be, it would be kind of a waste of time if you did all this computation and then at the end it's like, oh, you got an error. So it's good to catch your errors early and often. So in our case, what I'm gonna do as an example is I've set this up as like an early conditional to check if somebody provides us a language that's not available. And so to give you an example of this, I'm gonna use Klingon. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, Klingon is a fictional uh, species in Star Trek. So if you're not familiar, it, here they are, here's kind of an example of them. Uh, but there is a Klingon language that you can learn. Uh, you can actually buy the dictionary on Amazon. So someone might say, come across my function and say, hey, Colin, I want to learn how to say Klingon. Or I'm going to say, hello, how was your day in Klingon? All right, well, sure, you can provide me that input. But unfortunately, my, um, my function isn't that flexible. So it's going to say, hey, we don't know Klingon. Make sure you do English, French, or Spanish. Okay, well, can you do English? Yes, I can. Hello. How was your day? So kind of thing. So I guess the big thing about this is catch your errors early and often when you're creating your functions. Okay. Don't ask me how I know that Klingon is an actual language. So, but anyways. I noticed that I noticed that at least 657 people have bought that Klingon dictionary. <laughs> You know, Colin, my dream was to be married in the Star Trek, to get a Star Trek uh, wedding. You know, in Las Vegas, but my oh, parents don't. Right. So maybe you know how to say hello in Klingon. So maybe you won't need my function to do that. So, but <laughs> uh, maybe you could take my function and take it to the next level. But oh, well, I was going to ask you, Sandra, because you walked away because I had a function. I had this function be able to do it in French. So I wanted to ask if if this was uh, see if Google was good for asking the day. So. Is this the correct way to say hello? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, no, it's, no. Uh, it's, uh, it's not exactly correct. I'm sorry, I had to go because my uh, my kid need me. But yeah, but it's almost correct. Okay. Well, uh, if anybody from Google is watching this, uh, you might want to change your translation for uh, French. Um, no, it's a, no, it's a good, uh, it's a, it's a good tra traduction, but it's an improper grammar. Oh, okay. Well, I do have to apologize. I don't know French. I don't know Spanish very well outside of like my high school days of learning Spanish, but um, maybe you can help me, help me fix it. We were kind of joking around because you walked away and I said, well, hopefully my French wasn't so bad that Sandra had to walk away. <laughs> um, okay, so where was I at? Uh, okay, and then the next thing that it talks about with return values is can you make your function pipeable? And I had a question about this because I couldn't figure this out. I was playing around with it today. Um, now we forgot dot, 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 but uh, we'll talk about dot, dot, dot real quick before I do this. So dot, 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 from the way I understood it was kind of like a catch-all. So say you have what they call a wrapper function, where you have a function that wraps around other functions. This dot, dot, dot allows you to pass those extra arguments into your function so that they get passed to the function that you're wrapping your function around. So I'm going to simplify our, our print hello function to make it a little bit easier to see. But the book talks about hello, how or not hello, it talks about using it with stir C. So say if I wanted to like include like my own personal message in this, I can make it extensible by doing the dot, 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 and then passing whatever string value I want into that message. So in our case here, I want to say, hello, what was something good about today? Well, now I can do that. I can pass that through the function without having a specific um, argument set up in my function. Same thing, if I don't want a message, um, I can say message false. I can still pass it along. And I think this is where lazy evaluation comes into play. And Ryan, correct me if you're wrong, because I think you understand lazy evaluation more than I know. But because that might be I, generous, but okay. 
<laughs> From the way I understand it is because we have message false and it's not, it doesn't have anything for the dot, dot, dot in here. It won't do anything with this. It will just leave it alone. Right. And it, cause I remember lazy evaluation being, it's only going to run the stuff that it needs. Right. Yeah, that's how I remember it too. But uh, but that's only from reading, you know, a couple of paragraphs about it or something. So yeah, that makes sense. That I think that's I I think this is a case for lazy evaluation because I don't need it because I in my conditional I don't have a message, and I'm not providing a message. It's like well this this stuff that you provided I don't need it so I'm not going to process it. Is the way I understand it. So same thing here. If I just want to say hello, I can pass it along. No message, just say hello. Um, okay. And then the book talks about pipeable functions. So um, this is where I kind of, I had some more examples for this, but I got a little confused about this. So the book talks about two different pipeable functions. It talks about transformations and it talks about side effects. So I understood the transformations one, so being able to take your transformed computation and to pass it on to like other functions. So for my example here, I have a transformation function that's going to take the MT cars data set and group it by cylinder and then create a mean of the variable. Now, some of you might be asking, well, why do I have this kind of weird notation around my var argument? Uh, there, there are certain things that you need to do to program with dplyr in functions. So I've linked the blog post of how to do this, like programming with dplyr. You have to do, and I'll be honest that I haven't really fully read this and fully understood it, but if you're referencing variables that are passed from your arguments into your function using dplyr verbs, there's some stuff that you have to do to make it actually run. And I know that's probably not a very satisfying explanation on my part, but that's just kind of how I understand it. But if you want to learn like the ins and outs, I've linked the programming with dplyr of how to do that. This has been kind of changing because there used to be a couple ways to do it. There used to be this thing like unquo and quotient and using a thing called like, uh, I think it was called a bang bang. And so this is, I wouldn't say it's new, but it's newer way to kind of program with dplyr, but that's kind of getting amongst the weeds for what we're talking about. But if you're kind of interested in what this is, I've linked information about it. So anyways, I have this function here, but what I can do is I could run it, you know, get my calculation and my transformation. And if I want to pipe it into this next one, like the summarize and just roll it up to get like the overall average, because I have a data frame here and that's the last thing that's computated, that data type can be passed on to another dplyr verb into the next function. So that made a lot of sense to me. Um, is everybody good with that one? But the one that threw me for a loop was the one about side effects. And I was trying to play around with this a little bit and I couldn't figure it out. But because it was saying that you could use this, this thing called invisible, this function called invisible and pass along this, like pass along your data frame into it so you can do the next thing. And it talked about side effects in regards to like doing plotting. So like right here, I just have a, I have a basic function that just creates a plot for empty cars by passing in a variable and then whatever the fill is. So if I run my function here, it will produce my plot. But then I was like, okay, well, what if I just want this plot as like an intermediate plot of it, but then I want to pass that data frame onto like a view. Could I do that? And so I did it. And so I was trying invisible. And then I just said X, define my function. So it should return my plot in, in my mind. And then it should return the data object to be pipeable. But that's not the case. Because when I run the function by itself, it doesn't output a plot. But if I do it with a view, it will pop up the data object, but no plot gets returned. So I thought the book was a little unclear about this because it says that you can do you can do side effect functions 
and use that invisible return statement. So I don't know if anybody has any comments or if I'm thinking about it wrong or any thoughts, I would greatly appreciate it because it confused me. No, it makes sense. With you, you always say that the last, the, the function return what its last compute. So this part work. And uh, I have read the word side effect, but I never really understood what he means here. Yeah, and so, but then like in the book, it talks about like, it will, it will return a print, like it will return a print statement. So like, if I go back to the book and I look at it, like if I look at return values, so if I look at this, right? Like it will return the missing values to like the console and it will return the data object back to it. So that's what kind of confused me is like, well, well then why can't I have like a plot as a side effect get pushed to the viewer and then still be able to use that invisible function to do whatever computation I needed onto it. I just, I, my understanding is just not very clear there, but. I don't know. That's just what I was thinking. But maybe, maybe, maybe what's going to the console isn't considered like an object. It's just, well, I guess not an object. It's a side effect, you know? So, but if somebody's watching this and they have, and somebody wants to give me a better explanation of this, or if somebody comes across something, please let me know because I was kind of confused about it because the book says this is something that you can do with plots. So, uh, Anyways. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I I know there's like some discussion around this related to R being a functional programming language, and so I've watched some videos about what functional programming is, and they talk about side effects a lot. But um, I just still don't. I still don't entirely get it. So you're right. It is confusing. It's it's confusing to me, and I feel like even after watching you know hours of of instruction on it, it, the concept still eludes me. So maybe I'll post, maybe I'll post a question about this because in the book, it makes it sound like this is something that you can do, but it, at least in my environment, it doesn't work. Okay, cool. Um, again, we talked about uh, like explicit return statements. So we can use the return to return things, uh, you know, immediately. So in our case right here, like say we, it, so the book talks about this example, like say if something wasn't provided and you need it to be provided, what you can do is you can use this explicit return statement in a return function in your if conditional to, you know, catch errors early and often. In our case, the error being, hey, you didn't provide for us an X or a Y. And in that case, we're going to explicitly return zero and then stop computation. We've already kind of talked about that. And then it also talked about um, explicit return statements in cases where you have complex and, and, and simple kind of code. Um, so we talked about this already a little bit, like catching errors early and often. You could do this if conditional and then run all these lines of computation and then return something short. But what would be easier is if you flipped the easier computation up top and then caught that right away and then just returned that statement, you know, right away before you do all of this computation is the way I kind of understood what the book was talking about for um, explicitly returning like simpler statements versus doing all this complex computation. And then, you know, in the case of an error or something, um, returning something different. So, um, trying to think about where I'm at time-wise. I, I can get through this. So um, so we talked about pipeable functions. We talked about transformations. We talked about side effects. Um, transformations being object, function, returning a modified object. Side effects, I'm still a little, for me, I'm working on it, trying to understand it. But it usually takes an object, sends it into the function. Some action is performed and something is returned as a side effect. Jury still out on this about the plot idea because I'm not 100% sure of how that works, but in my mind it should work, but it doesn't. So um, those are transformations. Now, the last thing that the book talks about is environments, and this is the last thing we'll talk about today. But the way I kind of think about environments is, is that 
there the steps are takes to find values associated with the name. And so um, the book uses the, the term lexical scoping. Uh, I, if I could provide you an academic definition, I couldn't. But the way I just think about it is, is, is it's like, where does R look for the names that are associated with values? And so the one way I kind of think of it is that R kind of looks inside out. I don't know if that's the best way to explain it, but in my mind, that's how I view it. And so I just kind of created like a simple diagram of how I kind of view what it looks like. So say we have like a function within a function and this function, say it's looking for this value X, what it's first going to do is it's going to go like a step up and look into that first function. And if it can't find X being defined there, it's going to go up to the global environment and look for X. And if it's not there, then it's going to throw an error and say it's not defined. Now with our second function, it's looking for Y and it's only going to go one step because it's not going to look into these functions, but it's going to automatically go up into the global environment and look for Y, which is defined in the global environment. So, I mean, this is kind of my half-baked diagram idea. So if this is, if this needs to go in more detail or I didn't provide enough detail, let me know. But I just kind of think of it as like, these are functions are containers. Our global environment is a container and R kind of goes like steps up each step to kind of look for values and how things are defined. And there's a more eloquent uh, description of that and advanced R kind of covers this in more detail, but this is just kind of how I understand it at like a general way. So, yeah, and you know, it's out of the scope, but uh, when we try to debug a function and when we use browser, actually, if you could after get in the environment of the function and then after you could check out the variable compute inside the function. But for sure, it's not easy to, it's not easy to understand and, and debugging a function is uh, another level. Yeah, I think environments kind of get, um, and in my mind, it gets a little bit more complex than like this simple way to look at it and like, and you got to also, and maybe this is beyond our conversation, but you also, there's also different ways of how these values get assigned their values. So technically, when I was looking at this diagram, these would be the same. One is the same, but they're just getting a separate assignment. And I'm already wading in deeper waters than I should be wading in. So um I'm just going to say there's more complexity to this. This is just the best way I know how to explain it. It, it seems like the most practical way anyway, that if you're not finding your variable, maybe it's in a different environment. That's the way I understand it. And like I said, there's just, there's the computer science side of it that I just don't have enough training to say that I'm yeah. well informed enough to explain it. Cool. Uh, questions or discussion? I wanted to get through ni chapter 19 and I think we did it. So, yeah, it's fantastic. Fantastic stuff. Learned a ton. I had a quick question about wrapper functions. So, um, I have only really seen the term, but I don't know if I understand entirely what the idea is, other than you have like a base function and then, and, and maybe there's like dozens of lines of code that make that function do what it needs to do but you want to add one to it or you want to make one slight addition. And so you call that function with one slight change added on to it. And then now it's a wrapper function. Is that, is that the idea? I'll let, does anybody, I've, I've been talking a lot. Does anybody want to add in on that? I mean, I have a viewpoint of it, but. It seems like it's just a function that does what a, a standard function does, except like slightly more. But that's I, what I don't know. That's yeah. The best way I've thought of it is it just it takes the functionality of one function. Well, yeah, I think yeah. Now that I'm talking through it and thinking about it, I think that's basically it. Like it takes the functionality of one function and then expands on that with whatever tools you want to add to it. So. Yeah, I think I think you're at least my viewpoint. I think that's a correct explanation of it. 
Um, I also think of wrapper functions too, because people talk about like with like APIs. So like application programming interfaces that you can have access to. Like I hear a lot of people saying, I'm creating a wrapper, I'm creating wrapper functions for this API so that you can make a request into the API and get it returned. So it's like you create an R interface for it. So our users can easily interact with it by using those wrapper functions rather than doing like HTTP requests on your own. You can just create simple wrapper functions around the API to use the function of the API to get what you want back is what I, my experience with wrapper functions. Anybody else? Thinking about the invisible thing, I think I think what Sandra said was uh, correct. What happens is that the moment that you put invisible at the end, that that's the last argument. That I mean, that's the last piece of it. So that's what it it's going to return. So what you have to do is specifically ask. Uh, to print the previous object. See, I thought about that too. So like, if I do return though, like I, I tried this, like thinking, okay, what if I explicitly return it and then do invisible? Is that what you're thinking of? No, because even if you put return, it's going to take the last one. It's going to take invisible. But if you put the print, ggplot, blah, blah, then that's, it's going to work because it's going to print and then do the, the, you know what I mean? Like explicitly it's going to print. Okay. And then now it should, oh well, yeah, I think it returned. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Hmm. Then my question is, is this, is this, well, my question then is, if we printed this, it did print it, and we see it, is this a true object now? Is this a true object in our environment that we can access? I don't think so. Maybe it's what they call the side effect. Yeah, so it's a, it's a side effect. It's nothing you can, it's not a re, it's, it's not a real object in your R environment now. It's just, it's just the printout of the plot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I so uh, so I can't I can't find this I can't like take this plot and then like add theming to it or nothing to it. Right, but what you but what you can manipulate now is X because X um, um, that's going that's so the outcome of plot seal is going to be well the the printed plot because you asked it to print. But X. So now, if you if you put plot seal, and then you try to do things with it, it's going to take the as you did with view. Like it's going to take the it's going to take X. So if you mutate or do something else, it's going to take X. Well, then it should be able. To, then I should be able to take my function here, pipe it in here, right? I sh should, right? Yeah. Should should is the. No, it does. I think it does. Yeah, because it does the computation and then it prints out the plot. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. I have. I will thoroughly say that when I read the Pivable stuff, I actually learned a lot because it made a lot, a lot more sense to me now with creating Pivable functions. Before I was like, oh man, that sounds like a heavy lift. But when you think about it, it's just like, what type are you passing out? And then what type are you passing out of the function? So this actually clears it up quite a bit because now this this plot isn't a real object in our environment at least i'm saying this confidently someone may have a <laughs> have a different view that's knows this a lot better than me but i would understand that that this is not a real object this is just a side, a side effect. effect yeah hmm. but to make it a real object then you could assign it within that function you could uh no because your the scope is gone right so if you took that gg plot line and mm -hmm. assigned it to a to a value mm -hmm. say like why. yeah or, yeah why well yeah because you're only defining why here yeah within 
I mean, we could do what we talked about last time, but I don't want to go down that route yeah. with the double. I think, yeah, I think that's discouraged anyway, for some reason. <laughs> that but but event if you wanted to use the gg plot as an object then you should explicitly that should be the return value that you should return right mm -hmm. um, no I, I i mean makes sense because again we talked about if we wanted to return both of these objects mm, yeah so if you wanted to return both of them how would you do it well that's a good question well if i had x Oh, I think uh, I'm just like off roading now. <laughs> like, <laughs> so this to, go ahead, Maria. I'm just wondering if you can use return with several um, objects. Well, this is what I'm thinking is you could do like a return list, right? Because you have the list object and return it. I mean, like I said, I'm I'm completely off roading, so this could <laughs> blow up in my face right now. So you should. Uh, Let's see, right? Oh yeah. See, so, well, now we got. Oh, because I. <laughs> you print, yeah. I printed it. it, and you assigned it, and you returned it. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay, because I was like, I was sitting there, I was like, now I have three things. This doesn't make sense, yeah. but now, now it makes sense, right? Because now I returned it in a list. Okay. Again, if anybody's watching this in the future, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is best practice, but you can do it. So there you go. <laughs> It makes perfect so you, sense, though. Yeah, just return it. Just re, just add everything to an object that can hold it all. Yeah. The list. Yeah. At least in my naive understanding of it, there might be a more elegant way or different way to do it. But yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense to me. You know. Seems good. Cool. Well, we're already we're we're five minutes over, so I appreciate everybody staying extra long. Yeah. So um, this is helped out quite a bit now i think i know functions a lot better yeah that's good stuff all right uh, well i guess we'll cut it off there since we are a little bit over um, but save your questions and maybe there'll be some time to talk about it next week and i will handle vectors next week and uh, in the meantime we will talk on the chat so thank you colin thank you everybody for your participation and we'll see you next time thank you later all right bye